So welcome to day two at Max. How are you all doing? You good? Yeah. OK, we're going to have a great day. Yesterday, you saw all the amazing technology that we've been working on here at Adobe. And today, we're going to celebrate what's possible when that amazing technology gets put into the hands of creative people like you. So what does it mean to be creative? Well, it's different for everyone. It's painful, it's euphoric, it's scary, it's inspirational. But when there are 12,000 creative people in one room, it's communal. And that's why Max is so special. The origami cranes in the hall, the amazing work in the community pavilion, the doodle chalkboard, and of course, Russell Brown's neon pillows. There is a crazy amount of creativity happening right here in Las Vegas at this year's Max. And this is what you all have done while you're here. So give yourselves a hand. It's amazing. And that's why we bring you all together every single year. This community is what fuels us. And while our job is to innovate and inspire, it's really you who inspire each other and us. So today, we are going to hear from four incredibly inspirational creative people, a potter, a photographer, a musician, and a filmmaker, people who are just like you, mavericks in their fields charting new territories of creative expression. They will share their work, their creative process, and their paths to success, and I promise you are going to love it. So let's get started with our first presenter, potter and designer Jonathan Adler. Jonathan launched his namesake brand in 1993 after leaving his day job to pursue a career in pottery. Today, he has over 25 stores around the world, a thriving e-commerce business, and a full slate of residential and commercial projects. He has redefined modern design with his bold, glamorous work. And when you see an Adler piece, you know it's an Adler piece. Jonathan is a philanthropist, supporting many causes, including cancer research, animal rescue efforts, and the fight against AIDS. Please welcome Jonathan Adler. I started my business with like a real kind of it, I have nothing to lose idea. I got fired from every job I ever had. I was sleeping with everybody in the office. I found myself at 27, unemployed, unemployable, and I was like, I guess I'm gonna try to be a potter. I've done a terrible job of branding myself because nobody knows I'm a potter, but that's my most authentic self. And I think being a potter has really informed all of my design work because I definitely have an understanding of how stuff is made. When I started, there was nothing, me and clay. And it's like my world has gone like from this to like this, and it's crazy. Oh, hello, Janine. Oh, hi, Jonathan, how are you? I'm good. I'm liking that it has that like YSL 70s vibe. It does. That is sassy. My adorable husband always says that I'm sort of like Ariana Grande, like a little pop sprite who has this very positive approach to life and then the other part of my personality is brooding and self-critical and depressive. Those are two essential parts to being a successful creative person. You gotta have both. Hi, how are you guys? This is crazy. This is like the opposite of my real life, where I am a potter, where I am in my pottery studio in a very insular, um, closed environment. So this is like crazy and expansive. I'm so happy to be here among so many creative people. Um, so yay. Um, very different from a potter's normal life. So I'm going to tell you a bit about myself. I am a potter. I'm a designer. I'm a craftsperson. Basically, I make stuff. And I must say, from the very first moment I touched clay at summer camp, moi, summer camp, um, I felt a connection to clay. I knew this had to be my future. 
Um, I, and it wasn't just because my pottery counselor was super hot. It was because I loved clay. Um, so I always wanted to be a potter, but I didn't want to be this potter. I didn't want to be a hairy potter. Um, I know, right? Um, like, when you, if you were to all close your eyes right now and think about a potter, this is what you would think of, right? And this is the work you would imagine that he would be making. Um, a typical potter is sequestered in a garret in Vermont, making sad pots that he tries to hawk at rain-soaked craft fairs. Um, it's a sad life. It wasn't my truth, and I never wanted to be that potter. I just wanted to be a potter. Um, and so when I first started, I decided to make pottery that looked like this, pottery that was clean and graphic and uplifting um, and really was a reflection of me. So I'm here to talk about my pots, but I'm really treating this more as like a group therapy session, as an opportunity to talk to and with like-minded creative people like me and kind of tell you a bit about my creative process that I imagine you guys will relate to. Um, and really what I want to talk about is um, how much I hate myself. <laughs> I absolutely hate myself and I absolutely love myself. Um, and that that dichotomy between self-love and self-loathing I think is the fuel to all of my creativity, and I reckon you guys understand what I mean. Right? And I don't think people are that honest about it. You know, people, people when they talk at things, tend to sort of make everything seem effortless, and of course, the finished product should look effortless. It should look as if it was just always there. But I think we all know how torturous it is to get there. So I'll tell you a bit about my process. The self-love part. Self-love doesn't just grow hair on your palms. Loving yourself, <laughs> loving yourself is really how ideas happen. You know, I, I'll tell you, like, I woke up one morning and I thought, there's a huge problem in the world. Why aren't there any mugs that are based on iconic rap stars? <laughs> and so I raced to my studio and I made some mugs. Um, I did like a Kanye, and I did a Run DMC, um, and there they are in real life. Um, another day I woke up and I thought, hold on, grenades are beautiful. Like grenades are incredible forms. They're organic, they have like this incredible shape, and their, their texture is really beautiful. So I raced to my studio, um, and I made a group of vases that were inspired by grenades. That's moi at the wheel. Those are the pots in process. Um, and here they are finished. They kind of capture that menacing spirit of grenades. Um, and again, I woke up and thought, this has to happen. Uh, or um, I designed a hotel in Palm Springs called the Parker Palm Springs. And I realized there was a giant field at the Parker that absolutely needed a seven-foot-tall bronze banana. <laughs> right? Um, so I made a seven-foot-tall bronze banana. Um, and I think, I think that all of the ideas that I've talked about seem sort of preposterous. They seem, like, really insane. But of course, when I had them, I thought, these ideas are incredible because I had them. These are my ideas, so they're fabulous. So that's the, that's the very beginning of my creative process. The rest is where my self-loathing comes in. Um, I think that you need to be able to go from that little moment of inspiration, and then you, you need to start to put that into the world, and then once you start, you need to think, oh my god, this is going to be a failure. This is absolutely going to be a disaster because I am doomed to fail because I'm me. Um, <laughs> and I think that, that then you need to try to overcome that feeling of inevitable failure. So, for instance, doing this bronze banana took many, many months of prototypes and work to, to coax it into being. 
Um, it's an impossible balance to strike between love and hate, but it is one that I have been exploring in my entire career. There's the bronze banana. Right? Um, love and hate, y'all. I actually do it explicitly, whether it's in needlepoint pillows or ceramic vases like you see here. Um, these are some giant lucite pills that I made, and I think, you know, I, I think of my, my career as being like an Alice in Wonderland, take the pill and go down the rabbit hole and see what happens. And I think these giant lucite pills express that. Um, there are so many reasons why you shouldn't do something, and of course they're correct. The truth is that every idea is a very bad idea. <laughs> it really is. Like, you know, every idea is a terrible idea, and um, to make anything, you really need to either be so dumb or so full of undeserved self-esteem that you don't know you're dumb. <laughs> and now I'll just show you more of my stuff. I've, I've you know, I, I started out as a potter, and now, of course, I make everything for the home. I'm a retailer. I'm an interior designer. Um, I'm a very, very prolific dude and a very, very glib and happy dude and a very tortured dude. Um, I like to make stuff that's surreal. This is sort of a dreamy group of products, and I'll just tell you a bit. Like, there's a sofa there inspired by a cloud. I woke up one morning and thought, I got to make a sofa inspired by a cloud. Um, and I sketched it, and then I've been to the workshop for months trying to get the shape just right. It's that constant, like, I'm up, then I'm down. I'm, I'm tortured, I'm happy, I'm tortured, I'm happy. I'm like on an emotional roller coaster all the time. Um, and I think that my work is really a window into my mind. Um, as you can see, I make lots of stuff in lots of different media. I love surrealism. That's my dining room at my house in New York. Um, and that's my house in the country. You're seeing all my houses. I'm so great. <laughs> no, I've been very lucky. I have been a very lucky guy. Um, my creative odyssey has been a really unexpected success story. When I first started making pots, I thought, there's nothing to, to gain, there's nothing to lose, I just need to be creative. That was really how I started, and any success I've had has been purely a byproduct of an intense focus on creativity in everything I do. Um, so I, I, I suspect you guys can all relate to that, to the purity of design, I think really needs to be where everything starts, um, and then it is a battle. It is a battle to make it all come through. Um, so I'm just going to show you a little more of moi. Moi. Drugs. It's so funny. I do lots of drug iconography. I don't take any drugs. I am like the most ascetic clean living person you can ever imagine, but I feel like design is an opportunity to express all different sides of myself and to live vicariously. So it's a, it, for me, my, my design journey really is a window into my somewhat tortured, somewhat gleeful um, mind. And I think my sort of design um, mantra really comes from En Vogue, free your mind, and the rest will follow. Um, they said it best. So that's my take on me. Um, and now Anne is going to come out to talk to me about me even more. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Proper high. Okay, so first of all, this is Jonathan's incredible little interior here, and this is the world's most comfortable, beautiful chair. So normally we don't like splurge for beautiful things like this, but here we go, he's here, so we're doing it. <laughs> so um, Jonathan, your company motto is like the best company motto ever. If your heirs won't fight over it, we won't make it. Yes. 
my God. Okay, so how does that mantra play out in your cre creative process? Well, it's a, it's a really crowded world. There's a lot of stuff in the world, um, but I try to make great stuff. I had a, I had a very um, chic grandmother who had incredible objet around her house, and when she died about 20 years ago, my brother and sister and I had fist fights over her stuff. <laughs> like, and I thought, that's what I want my stuff to do. I want it to engender lawsuits between siblings. <laughs> like, that's how I'll know I've succeeded, if, some, if I make something that really stands the test of time. And as I said, it's a very crowded world. There's a lot of stuff. So I strive to make stuff that's perfectly crafted, very eccentric. Mm -hmm. I feel like the key to making things that people's heirs will fight over is being eccentric and true to yourself. So, um, yeah, everything I make is is, is Did you get good eccentric. stuff from your I friend? did. I won. You did. They're older than me, but I'm a scrappy little fighter. I'm not surprised. <laughs> so, um, your work can be very provocative, and um, you are, as you said, amazingly prolific. So, how do these ideas come to you? Like, so you had the cloud chair, like, you're just sitting there, and all of a sudden, you have a vision? You know, people always say to me, like, what are your sources of inspiration? And it's such an impossible question to answer because the world is so crowded and busy. And it really, for me, it really does come back to the en vogue paradigm. Yeah. Free your mind. Yeah. Um, I get so many ideas um, while I sleep. Like, I dream about things and write them down. I spend a lot of time on my paddleboard in my Hamptons house um, thinking. And I really try to open my mind. It's funny, I don't take any drugs, as I said, but I, a lot of my work actually is sort of an homage to LSD and mind-opening <laughs> drugs. So I don't take them myself, but I sort of, I, I try to be on a journey of um, opening my mind. So um, you're a huge success, but you're also a do-gooder, which we at Adobe love, and I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what does using design for good mean to you? Um, or do you use design for good? I mean, I, I think, you know, of course, like anyone, I try to be as positive a force in the world as I can. I try to, you know, source things ethically and support charities. But if I'm being honest, I actually think of myself as very selfish. Mm. I'm sort of living, I'm almost like an Ayn Rand hero. Like, I, I have a very selfish um, odyssey. I make the stuff that I want to make. Mm. My career is really about me. Um, and I, I, I sound glib, but I, I do think that the key to design success is being very, very like honest and personal in your work and, and self-aware. You're self very self-aware. I am very self-aware. Yeah. But I try not to be. <laughs> I think it's good to be self-aware. Well, I'm a ruminative person. I like really, I, sometimes I fear that I think too much and it's sort of it's an odd balance I strike because I really have to do. Like, I'm a very restless guy. I'm like, I'm constantly making stuff, but I'm also constantly thinking. And I'm, I'm like on a roller coaster, dudes. It's tough. We had two quotes up there earlier. One was about anxiety being like a fuel for creativity. And the other was something like, don't think. Think inhibits creativity. Yes, those, that's my truth. OK, good. <laughs> So what's your, you showed us so many incredible things. What is your favorite, favorite Jonathan Adler design and why? Wow, um, I guess my favorite thing is probably whatever I made most recently. <laughs> because as I said, it's like... What every, did you make most recently? I actually just made this incredible um, new vase that has like, it's like this big and it has lips all over it. Um, and it's going to change the world. It's going to be the vase that is going to change the world. <laughs> I know it. Um, no, I, I think that, uh, as I said, you need to really feel like whatever you're doing is the thing. You need to be on that sort of journey of optimism and belief that um, whatever you're making is going to be incredible. Um, but I, you know, as you've said, I'm very prolific. I'm extremely lucky, and I live with my stuff. I love to look at it. I love what I do. That's so awesome. Okay, so what are you working on next? So, I mean, you're making so many things at once. Like, is there one big thing that you're focused on right now? Um, 
I am just doing more. I, I feel like my, my... How could you do more? I do more. I'm just like more, 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 like that disco song. I get a lot of inspiration from songs. More, more, more. How do you like it? How do you mind. like yeah. it? <laughs> Katy Perry, I'm hot, then I'm cold. I'm up, then I'm down. Um, <laughs> I'm doing more because I think that, you know, the, the truth is every, every career has a sell-by date. You know, everybody has a shelf life. We're all not going to do this forever. Um, We're not? I know, right? <laughs> You know, I, I would like to do this forever, but the reality is that careers end, and I feel like while I'm in the middle of it, I'm just trying to do as much as I can. My, my husband, Simon Doonan, who's a brilliant creative himself and whose books you guys should read, um, wrote in one of his books that he thinks life is like a giant disco cube. You know, one of those cubes in a disco where you stand up and you jiggle on it, um, and you jiggle around. Um, <laughs> And then he said, aging is when you finally are done jiggling, you fall off the cube, and it's somebody else's turn to jump up and jiggle. Yeah. Um, so I think that I am in the middle of jiggling around on the disco cube of life. I'm like pouring everything I've got into my jiggle. Um, <laughs> and I'm, you know, just doing more of it. Well, the jiggling's worked, and we're delighted to have you here. Thank you so much. Jonathan Adler. Thank you guys so much. Okay, was he now fabulous? And he knows he's fabulous, which is even more fabulous. So uh, next up, we have photojournalist Annie Griffiths. And Annie was one of the first female photographers at National Geographic. Over the course of her career, she has taken photographs in nearly 150 countries. She's the executive director of Ripple Effect Images, which is a collective of photographers who document programs that are empowering women in the developing world. She's published three books, and her photography has received awards from the Associated Press, the National Press Photographers Association, and the White House News Photographers Association. It's an honor, a true honor, to have her here today. Welcome, Annie Griffiths. What I love most is when I'm sitting in a hut and the people there have forgotten about me and they go back to their yeah. regular life and I get to witness it. That is my favorite thing about my job. When I started at National Geographic, I was one of the first women, but I was also the youngest by a good bit. I was so inexperienced. I was very intimidated and very apprehensive, working harder than I'd ever worked in my life. This was a completely new deal for me. I'd never been east of Ohio, and suddenly there I am at National Geographic working in three or four different countries on a project. As I started traveling overseas, the human stories that constantly drew me in were usually about women. When you humanize a culture or an issue, people are very capable of getting it. If I can help provide that perspective that motivates people to be more open-minded and kinder and more generous, then that's what I want to do. Last night, I was part of an accidental dinner where just eight different creatives from different parts of the business ended up at the same table, and it was, the energy was incredible. So here we are with 12,000 of you guys. So drink it in. Drink it in, because this energy is, is just magnificent, and only Adobe could pull this off. Um, I, I grew up in... <laughs> Yeah. I grew up in Minnesota and never traveled anywhere. Um, and one of the highlights every summer for me in Minnesota was we, we'd all go to the Apple River and we'd tube down the Apple River. That was high excitement in my world. Um, and it became so much fun because you could literally tube for a couple hours. And we'd bring like an extra inner tube for the cooler to have the beer and all the other stuff. And um, over time, 
We were loving this river to death. And the first time I saw a creative solution, simple creative solution, was somebody figured out how to, how to concentrate the trash. And so around every bend of the river, they put a huge, like, bigger than a trash can, a barrel, and they'd have colorful targets over the barrel. So, of course, everybody started throwing their beer cans and their bottles and their soda cans and everything, um, and it changed the river. And I thought, that's creativity. That's creativity to get something done. And I am um, very practical, um, very pragmatic in, in many ways, but I also have an artistic soul. And these pictures are from my first uh, work with National Geographic when I was in my early 20s. And what an opportunity. You know, at that time, but I was so in love with photography. I just wanted to take really beautiful images. And, and then I got this platform to do it. And I, I kind of couldn't believe my own luck. And I also hope they didn't figure out that they had really shouldn't have hired me to begin with. <laughs> But in, that, in those early days, I remember searching for beauty. Really, pretty much that was it. Beautiful pictures. That's, that's what I was interested in. And that's what I was trying to find wherever I worked. And I worked, you know, first a little bit in the United States and then started traveling. And what our job really was was to take pictures of things either that everybody knew about and, and do them in a new way or to go to some fantastical place and take pictures of things people had never seen. And that was pretty much the job, and I loved it. And it, and it was a gas. I mean, I was traveling. I'd, like, really never been east of Ohio. And suddenly, I'm, I'm all over the world. Uh, that, this is in New Zealand. And I, you know, and, and, I, and I'm free. Now, it's enough freedom to, you know, hang yourself. <laughs> Because we would go off on assignment, and they'd just see us at the end, and there was no shot list. There was, you just had to figure it out. And this is in Namibia, one of my favorite countries in the world. And, and we got to do all this intrepid stuff. I've traveled in so many different ways, including camels, elephants, motorcycles, hang gliders, you name it. And it's fun. I mean, to me, it's, it's a blast. But as time went on, I kind of had this longing to, to seek more than beauty in my photographs. I really became more interested in the people than the place. And I wanted to show um, the connective tissue among all cultures and also the things that set us apart. So, of course, Argentina. This is in Mexico where a family was so thrilled that their daughter and her 15th birthday, her quinceañera, that they painted their whole house pink. I wanted those kinds of insights into cultures and people and things we share. And I also wanted to push back against um, generalized, you know, really, really offensive and inaccurate portrayals of other people. So my favorite thing always has been to get to the core of the culture. This is like, is this British? These guys actually raise mice in their back garden and then show them competitively, and I'm sure you figured out you're looking at a winner right here. This is, this is Mr. Wormald, who's the, um, the chair of the Calder Valley Mouse Club. I laugh all the time. You know, I see these are Aussies. How Aussie is this? You know, they're out on the Sydney Harbor and they dress their boat like Swan Lake for this parade. But they've been out there drinking beer for so long that they can't, their inner ballerina started coming out. And I looked over to see their crossed ankles and their curled toes, and you just can't make this stuff up. <laughs> it's a joyful journey. It really is. This is the graduating class of a high school in North Dakota. And, and this is a, a gaucho in Argentina teaching his nephew how to get a horse's trust, because that's what they do, they're horse whisperers. And this is the first rays of sunrise coming into the Dome of the Rock. 
to end the fast of Ramadan. Those moments, that opportunity has never, um, it's, I've just never felt jaded about it. I feel, I really, I hold my breath and I think, oh my gosh. Maybe never more than this picture, which is on top of Victoria Falls. And it was at a, a real turning point in my life where I realized that I wanted my work to be the target above the trash can that saves the river. I really wanted to, to have you know, as much meaning as possible in what I did. And so in addition to my work with Geographic, I started working for aid organizations. This was done for Habitat for Humanity. I worked on a number of projects with them. And this is all that's left of the mighty Colorado River when it reaches the Sea of Cortez because we have completely siphoned it off. And these environmental stories were important to me. This is what's happening to the Dead Sea. It's evaporating so quickly that all that's left behind are these salt formations along the entire edge of the Dead Sea. You know, I, I, I love working with nature and wildlife projects, but it's not my specialty. But the thing that I have come to realize is that if we want to save the orangutans, then we have to empower the local people to value that resource because it will actually bring them more money than slash and burning and planting palm oil trees will. That, that they have a treasure they can be proud of. I, did, I covered the oil industry in, uh, off the coast of Louisiana, and this was before Katrina. But the oil industry has so decimated the salt marshes that are the filter that protects the shore that of course now when these big hurricanes come, they're going to do so much more damage. I was born under a lucky star, and I think all of you were too. And it, whether it comes from genealogy or geography or just dumb luck, you're all here because you're fortunate. And I can't think of anybody who in the early years was more fortunate than I was. And yet all of us at a certain point come to either a crossroads, or in my case a train wreck, that um, makes us have to think really hard and make decisions about our future. So my perfect storm came in my mid-50s. This is my family that I grew up with. And you can see, of course, fashion icon that I am. I'm the one in the fuzzy white hat. Um, but in a single season, my mother took the deep dive into Alzheimer's, and my 20-year marriage evaporated in a humiliating way. And you can only have a pity party for so long. I remember reading an article at that time that said basically a woman in my situation should just get some cats and a vibrator and, <laughs> and call it a day. Well, sadly, I'm allergic to cats, so I started doing aid work. And I had learned early on that the most creative people on earth are poor women. They're unbelievable. They can take a scrap of metal or, or plants and, and pound things into a cooking pot or, or a piece of jewelry. I mean, this, this is pounded metal from a, a Bedouin woman in Syria. And, but the most creative thing they do is they keep their children alive in some of the most god-awful circumstances you can imagine. And yet, <laughs> yay for them. And so I started really focusing on programs that empowered women and their children in the developing world. And, uh, you know, I, I just I knew that they were the key, that they were the best investment we could make in our shared future. And the thing that, you know, doesn't get talked about much in this world is that it's working. There's less poverty. More girls are getting an education. 
It's not all doom and gloom, and it's because these people are magnificent. So I, I worked with a number of different aid organizations, and I was really feeling, this. okay, this is my calling, this is what I want to do. And, um, and I, you know, went from refugee camp to refugee camp to communities that were doing something innovative and, uh, you know, just a little cement and a little uh, engineering know-how, and women will do the rest. And it was, you know, it was really starting to become my DNA to work with these great women and to tell unreported stories. I, it's just unbelievable how few stories are told about women. And they're almost always portrayed as victims. And the focus is often on their sexual vulnerability. That's just not fair or accurate or OK in any way. They're amazing. And I came to a little crisis point myself when I took this picture. I was in a refugee camp in Kenya, and I met this Somali woman, Marwa, and I just loved her. And her little girl was so sick. And I just, I took this picture, but I had my own personal crisis. I mean, what am I doing? How can I make a dent in this? This is maybe hopeless. But I did my job, and two years later, I was in a refugee coordinator's office in Richmond, Virginia, and this picture had been torn out of the aid group's calendar and put on the wall. And I saw it, and I, and I said to the refugee coordinator, oh, wow, that looks familiar. And he said, yeah, and she's doing great. And I said, you know her? He said, oh, yeah, she's one, they're one of our refugee families, and everything's fine. And, and it was just like this enormous relief. I didn't get her out of the refugee camp. I take pictures. But if my pictures can support the, the people who are doing this important work, then that's what I want to be doing. And three weeks ago, Adobe helped me find Marwa. So here she is here. And there, and there she is now. And that sick little baby is 16 years old and looking at colleges now. It's, uh, it works. It works. So after that, I called my girlfriends, who are some of the best photographers on earth, and I said, you know, these were women who were already doing aid work and some really great guys, too. And I said, look, why don't we learn from the women we document? that if we work together, we can get a lot more done. And they all said yes, and we started Ripple Effect Images. And in six years, we have worked with 26 aid organizations, we have done 28 films, and we have an archive of 25,000 images, and our aid organizations have reported raising over $10 million using those assets. And it's about you know, what women need, it, 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 you know, we know what's basic, water, you know, and the joy when they actually can see water coming out of the ground, and they're so willing to do the work. And then, for the first time in many of their lives, they can actually be clean. Because if water is so precious that you're walking 11 hours to get it, when you get back, you're not going to bathe. You're going to, you know, keep your kids alive. So. We look at all as solutions across water, food, you know, these great agricultural programs. Most people don't realize that most of the farmers in Southeast Asia and Africa are women. Um, and they are so eager to learn that if they plant beans instead of corn, their kids will get better. You know, they'll be healthier. They, that, that, you know, livestock can survive climate change if you mix up the feed. And they can be taught how to tell if their kids are healthy or not. And you can see, they take it so seriously. They're, this is an area of Indonesia that had terrible malnutrition, and the women are like now leading the communities in making sure that kids are safe. This, this community is so remote, I crossed a river 33 times on a motorcycle to get there. And they had never heard of a germ. How could they? And so this aid organization, 
was teaching them about basic nutrition and health and that if you wash, your kids won't get sick as much. And it made a huge change in the whole community. The one that breaks my heart is, is the single biggest killer of women and of kids five and under in the world. And I bet hardly anybody knows what it is. It kills more people than AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combined. And it's household air pollution. And uh, it's completely preventable. It's from cooking and heating fires and lighting with toxic chemicals and, and fossil fuels. And this is a, a woman who was testing clean cook stoves in India. And you can just see that, you know, that, that her joy that she can actually even have her family in the kitchen now because they aren't fleeing the smoke. Education. Oh, it's what every, every mother wants for her kids. And the girls want it too, let me tell you. And, and there are really leading countries like Rwanda who've made it mandatory education for all children, not just boys. Because in so many places, if a family's going to send someone to school, it's going to be the boy. And, um, and school is prohibitively expensive for, for many, many families. But they learn, and it changes their life, and they, and they go on and, and lead their communities, and they gain dignity. It's, it's the heart of empowerment. This is the poorest woman I've ever met in my life, and I say that because she had lost seven children to malnutrition. It just it didn't get worse than that. And she got a little micro loan, and she met this little girl who was an orphan, and she took her in, and she bought a goat so she could give the little girl milk. And then she started breeding goats, and she started making a little more money. And the first thing she did was send this little girl to school. And as I was, I was with them for much of a day, and as I was leaving, the little girl came up to me and asked me for my notebook and my pen and brought them over to her, her mother to show me that she had taught her mom to read and write. And that's the ripple effect. And people who don't have, you know, people who have no education are still perfectly capable of being taught. So this program, they were teaching women how to build solar lanterns. They're solar engineers. And so this woman had built 50 of them. And this is her final exam where they give her a broken one to see if she can fix it. Well, she passed. Now look at the body language as she goes to give a bottle of light, 50 bottles of light to all her girlfriends. That's empowerment. That's what's going to work. And look at the girlfriends. This woman never had a day of education. She was taught to run a solar desalinization plant in a really, really desperately salty part of India. And I went there to cover the salt farming, which is often done by young girls. I was there with a health group, which, and usually, you know, you don't realize what a toll it takes on the human body. And they were helping. But at the end of the day, this little girl ran over to a solar lantern that I hadn't even seen. And I said to her, you have a solar lantern. What do you, now what do you do? With, you know? And she told me she goes to school at night. And in her region, all the kids who have to work during the day now have an opportunity to go to school at night. So there are 70,000 children in her region who are going to school at night because of solar lanterns. And women are learning to, to work collectively. You know, they're um, farmers who used to just be laborers, and now they come together. This is the farmer on the right. She's finding out the quality and the weight of her grain. Meanwhile, out back is the commodities broker. You can't believe what a woman with a cell phone can do. And she's calling down to the market to get the going price for, for um, that crop, and then she undersells it by a couple of rupees, and she comes back in, and whoo! These women will never go back. They get it now. I'm going to finish in Pakistan because I have these experiences a lot, but I just want to impart one little precious evening to you. I was there covering a water issue. We were in a completely remote part of Pakistan, 
and uh, we were hours from the nearest road, and so we knew we were going to have to sleep in the desert, and this little community asked if we'd like to stay with them, and we said yes. And so with that, they brought out their two best cots and their best blankets, and the girls brought, we were sitting out in the open air on, the, on our little beds, and the girls brought us soup to drink, and, um, and then it was really getting dark. And they asked if we would like music. And I said, we would love music. And with that, like five little elderly men with homemade instruments came and made a circle around our cots and played until we fell asleep. And I promise you, these people had never heard of National Geographic. They're like people everywhere who have nothing, they give everything. So as you guys go through your careers, your beautiful, brilliant careers, hold in your heart something that's speaking to you so that when your perfect storm comes, you're going to be available. You're going to kind of have a path that comes before you. Think about what you want written on your tombstone. A couple months before I turned 60, Glamour magazine did an article, and they called me a camera-toting badass. <laughs> and that's what I want on my tombstone. <laughs> Thank you very much. Annie Griffiths, wow. Next up, we have Grammy Award winning producer, songwriter, and musician Mark Ronson. Known for his eclectic musical tastes, Mark has a unique ability to mix pop, rock, funk, and hip hop. He has worked with some small acts Adele, Amy Winehouse, Bruno Mars, and Lady Gaga. And luckily for us, he'll be spinning tonight at the bash. Oh, yeah. But first, he's going to come out and speak with our very own Jason Levine. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Hi, Mark. So I have so many questions for you, okay. so many things to ask, so little time to do it in. So let's, let's start from the beginning, really, and sort of how did you get your start, and take us Take us back. Take us way back. Um, well, I, I started out playing music as I was a kid. I was in a crappy high school bands and everything. And then uh, I got really into I was growing up in New York City. I was from London, but grew up in New York and uh, started DJing hip hop clubs in New York. Right. And just went around like taking my demo tape to every club and every promoter and hassling them until I got put on as a gig. And basically, well, to paraphrase Venkman from Ghostbusters, no fee was too small, no That's gig right. was too small. It was just like, yeah, you know, when you love something in the beginning, you'll do it any, anywhere anyone will have you. Mm -hmm. So one night I was DJing in a club and Puffy came up to me, Puff Daddy, and uh, I was DJing and he came over and he, he tried to give me a hundred dollar bill. And you know, I'm, I know the minute you take money from somebody, it's slippery slope. So I was like, no, no, sir, it's great. It's, you make all these great records. It's enough that uh, you're here enjoying it, because this was the beginning of Bad Boy and Biggie right. and all this stuff. And I, you know, I hero worship that stuff. And then he tried again. He's like, take the money. And I'm like, no, no, thank you. It's really great. I'm trying to get my mix on. He was like, take the effing bill. So I was like, OK, sir. <laughs> so I took the money. So you took it. Yes. I took the money. And, and uh, he started to take me around. And like that. I guess he was the first person that was like, had this stature that took me on and started to take, take me around the world and DJing and stuff. And that's how I started to make my name. And um, as far as production went, um, it was the same thing. I would go and take what you had at that time was like these beat tapes. You would make your instrumentals right. and you would go to labels and play it. And I got this remix for De La Soul, which was my first gig. Okay. And uh, it came out. Yeah, that's right. You, you wouldn't be doing that if you heard it. <laughs> Um, <laughs> no, no, it was like one of those things where like, you know how it's like when you have your little equipment, your home thing, you're the master of that. You know how to make it sound great. And I thought, oh, great, I'm going to take this, go into a fancy studio, yeah, and right. it's going to sound even better. even better. And it was the total opposite. Like at all these knobs and buttons around, I had no idea what I was doing. The speaker sounded different. And I remember hearing it in the room of this record company guy, Tommy Boy, and just wanting to cry and like throw myself out the window. Right. Um, but um, 
Yeah, it's, it wasn't that dramatic, but um, <laughs> I uh, and then my first production, real gig, was a, was an album for this amazing singer named Nika Costa, and uh, that was like my feather, like a feather, yeah. and, that, and that was my first. Out, that was the first time someone gave me a shot to produce uh, a whole album. Right. So now, just in terms of production and sort of engineering, who were your sort of biggest influences? Because I know you have kind of a very a vast array of musical knowledge and appreciation. Yeah. Um, I guess my heroes at that time, because I was like, I had a drum machine. I was very much into like making beats. It wasn't so much I didn't know about recording a whole band and right. musicianship and arranging till a bit later. But it was people like Q-Tip and the RZA, DJ Pro. Obviously, I loved Quincy Jones and like, you know, George Martin, the great heroes, but the people that felt a bit more attainable, like that was maybe some of those guys. Right. Um, and uh, I think when you're starting out, you just, you're borrowing all these influences from these things that affect you, and you try and you hope that you combine it in a way that it becomes your own. Right. Like, it's like Play-Doh, but you want to combine the colors and as long as it just doesn't make the brown one that nobody <laughs> likes, you know, but you hope that it becomes this fuses into this thing that's sort of your own and like people don't go like, oh, I see he took this, he likes this, but you, you get your own voice there. Right. Now, Anne mentioned some of, the, some of the very small artists you've worked with, Adele, Bruno Mars, of course, Paul McCartney, yeah. it's Wainwright. Um, They're going to be big one day. Yeah, right, yeah, right. It's going to be huge. Promise. So they say. Um, how do you decide who to work with? Um, well, first of all, I've been incredibly fortunate to meet some of those people like Adele and Amy Winehouse right. before they were massive superstars. So that's, that's definitely something. And I think that, I mean, obviously, there has to be some talent and something in what they do, but there's million talented singers, usually what happens is it's just a bit of a gut feeling when you sit and you meet with somebody for the first time and you engage in a conversation, you're like, I could do something with this person. Or there's a bit of a spark and then you're talking and then suddenly right. you catch fire and you're talking about all these music and things that turn each other on. But like, I mean, when I met Adele, she was 18, like... Hey, this was pre-19, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And uh, she was chain smoking Marlboro Lights, watching Jerry Springer. She looked like any teenager, like sitting in a thing with her feet up. And I went in and I was so surprised by her. She was so sure already about the kind of record that she was going right. to make. And, and uh, she played me this demo of this song, Cold Shoulder. And she's like, I want you to do this one. And I was kind of feeling myself, because maybe I was a bit bigger than she was at the time. I was like, all right, well, is there anything else you want to play me? She's like, no, nope, it's just this one. And she, I was like, oh, that's <laughs> right. cool. That's, and uh, Very confident, yeah. Same thing with when I first met Bruno Mars, you know, like, I, um, I went to meet him and I knew a couple of songs he had done from his first record. But it, uh, I just sat down and I asked him, I was like, what would you, what kind of record would you see us doing or what do you want to make? Because I think that's the best question you can ask someone when you first sit down, like, what would you like to make? What do you see your record sounding like? And he was like, I don't know, but I just want it to sound like whatever the opposite of people think that you and me making a record would sound like. Right. And I just, I loved that right away. I was like, this is a smart kid. And I, you know, and he just, just kind of had the fire in his eyes. Amy Winehouse was like the same thing. She just started talking about these 60s records and these influences and things that she loved. And right. I just, want, I instantly wanted to make something that would like impress her and, and like turn her on. And, so I guess that's how some of these things have started. And it's really listening to what they want, too. I mean, that's something that I think is kind of infused in all the productions you're doing. Right? I think so. You're really there to serve the purpose of the artist, to, to make that song feel like the most super bionic version of that song or that they're vocal. Because, um, you know, when an artist or a singer goes in, no matter how great they might be or how many times you see them on TV belting out a song, when they go into that booth about to record, they're in the most sort of insecure, vulnerable right. place that they, nice. they'll ever be in. So it's your job to just make them feel like they can do anything. Mm -hmm. And then also not push them too far to the brink of like, you know, they, the voice cracks or something that just like destroys their confidence and then the session's kind of, right. kind of like a wash for... Um, so, so yeah, I th that's what it is. It's never about like me putting my own stamp on it or like, 
hey, let's put some uptown funk horns on everything. It's just like whatever is really appropriate for that artist and that song. I think a lot of the classic producers implemented that same style too. Tom Dowd, right? He'd listen in, in the room and kind of understand what they were going for without having them say anything, just listen to what, the sound they were creating and then just try and repeat that back on tape or in this he, case, digitally, yeah. Yeah, I, I, agree, I agree with that. And Quincy Jones as well is like always talks about like he never had a sound and like, right. you sort of just need to be open to anything when it comes to inspiration and that sort of stuff and like, you know, whether you're religious or not, or whatever you believe in, like, I love Quincy's quote, like, you always got to leave a little, a little space in the room for God to come in, because you really don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Now, do you have any dream collaborators, like anyone that, I mean, you've worked with so many, anyone that you really, really long to work with now? Um, I think there's plenty of people who I love yeah. that I've never worked with, of course, so that's Kendrick Lamar, Radiohead, whatever, but I don't, I don't get too caught up in like, oh, I hope that happens because I feel like all the really good creative things that have happened to me have been by just kind of coincidence or organically or things coming together. So, so like, I'm not sure that if I ever I was just like sitting by the phone like, is Kendrick going to call today? Like, I don't, I, and even <laughs> if we did get in the studio, if it didn't happen in an organic way, I'm not sure how right. great it would be. So, you know. Um, I try not to say it out loud. Now it just sounds like I've just made like a whole 30 second ad for like Kendrick Lamar, please call me. <laughs> but th that's the other danger of it. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Now, well, so that, so that begs kind of an interesting question too. Have you, do you hear records and you think, I could have done that better? Or, oh, I would have liked to, I would have done it this way, or I wish they would have done something like that? I think a really good barometer of whether I love a record or not is if like the minute I hear it you're just like so jealous and you're like damn I wish I did that or like I can't believe I didn't think of that or they beat me to it or whatever. Right. Um, yeah sometimes I can't help listen to music without being like oh I wonder what mic they used on the snare drum or like I can't I could never listen to music during We'll say romantic times, right? Because uh, <laughs> because I think you that geek out a little on what's I, happening in the background. I wouldn't be able to concentrate. I'd be like, the drummer's not keeping time. There's like, there's, they should have uh, I don't know done that vocal. It's not in her right register. Um, so so yeah, I do. The brain is sort of always on. But I think that that's also the good thing because when you're sort of a creative, you always have to be like a little bit switched on because yeah. you don't know at what point. If it's as like cliche as the shower, walking down the street, or hearing a, a song like in the post office, what's gonna like trigger something? And right. be like, oh yeah, like you know the light bulb moment. Yeah. Now that kind of leads into the next one, which is sort of about your creative process. Now, obviously, again, in the earlier days when you're doing really more DJ style, uh, uh, drum and bass style, you know, just beat style, um, is there a particular way that you sort of begin? A song? Is it you know you, you, you start with? I mean I know it, it obviously changes depending yeah. on the artist and the mood, but uh, melody more, beat more, <laughs> lyric more. I think that it, like I said, like it, you just have to be open for wherever it might come because it's yeah. really a. I wish I was John Lennon just sit at a piano and just the songs of right just pour out life would pour out. But yeah. I like inspiration is a little bit more of a of a rare treasured thing for me. So that's why you're sort of open to it anyway. It could be like a you know, I remember hearing interviews that Lou Reed would just walk around museums and just over eavesdrop in people's conversations to like, that was how he'd start a song lyric. Right. For me, it could be scrolling through like a cool synthesizer and coming across a sound patch where there's just like this cool key that sounds like a cat being lost in space and you're just like, oh, that would be an interesting start to a song. Right. Um, most synthesizers do sound like Cats, cats lost in, in space. space yes. If you think about it, it's like what does that sound like? There it is, right? Yeah. yeah well, right. Um, and then, um, and then, like, it's, I'm lucky as well to work with these incredible artists. So sometimes it comes from their thing, or like, so, sometimes it's like conversational. I remember with when I first met Amy Winehouse and we were working together. We were getting to know each other and we were walking around Soho in New York, and she told me a story about, you know, a tough time in her life, and she said. Uh, you know, my family came over, they tried to make me go to rehab, and I was like, no, no, no. And I thought, like, <laughs> as much as this is a really right. important sensitive, thing, and I don't want right, to be yeah. insensitive, that just the way you said that right there is quite catchy. Like, would you be open to doing 
a song. And now, to be honest, like in light of having known everything she went through, and maybe going through after seeing the movie, like not to get too like deep, but like I might have thought twice about like making light of that. But a lot of the time, you know, she was just so inspirational. She'd have ideas for a piano line, or just she'd just throw out a melody, or show me a riff on the guitar, and like songs would just roll from there. Yeah. Yeah. Now you kind of alluded to this too, and again, just kind of looking at your catalog. I mean, it's very diverse, style, genre, tempo. Um, and I know you said before, you don't necessarily want to put a stamp on things, but would you say, what would you say is kind of your signature, either in production or in writing? I mean, I think that it's very easy to say you're striving to make something classic, and then it's a very different thing to, 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 to actually attain that. And it really doesn't happen. You're lucky if it happens one in a hundred times. Right. But I guess that's the thing, like going for the timeless. So I'm obviously influenced by all these classic eras of Motown and 70s Stevie Wonder and 90s hip hop and things that I love. But you're hoping that what you make isn't quite time stamped or that it's something that could right. hold up. And if that's about recording it with analog instruments or things that maybe won't be too much, too dated by an era, and then using the technology of the day as your friend to, you know, it'd be silly to not use the amazing tools of computing of and this kind of stuff, yeah. but to preserve the human voice in all of that. And what's timeless is, I guess, the, the, the human, human performance. performance. Yeah. Jinx. It's crazy. So at the same time, I gotta go. very good. Yeah, all right. No. <laughs> okay. Now, do you, um, I mean, you just mentioned sort of Motown and things, and I mean, are there any particular albums that you kind of go back to for inspiration? Um, there's things that are definitely like my old time favorites. Like we said, like Stevie Wonder songs in the Key of Life and mm. Zeppelin and the Beatles and Tribe and all those things. And then there's like records that come out, you know, a week ago that I listened to and I'm completely inspired right. by and blown away by. Yeah. Now, um, you mentioned too, sort of technology and leveraging the technology of the, of the day. Yes. Um, do you think the technology and the accessibility and the, and the availability of all this makes music making better compared to, say, years ago when you were doing it, definitely in a more analog style? Um, yeah, I think that there's an amazing thing about like the democratization of music that like anybody in their bedroom using a computer program can make something that it can not only be good, but yeah. that they can upload to the internet and can resonate within culture and get to everybody, you right. know, as fast as it, as, as it, as it can. Um, I still feel for my own style, the kind of music that I like to make, it's about having some kind of human touch in that. But then the technology that you can use to then chop it around and edit it and all this kind of stuff, when you use both of those things concurrently, mm. you know, the kind of the human, the human aspect of ideas and that kind of thing and performance mixed with what technology can do, then you kind of like, those are the best of both worlds. Right. And that's coming back a bit more now too, isn't it? There was a period, I think, 10, 12 years ago where it was very synthetic. Yeah. There wasn't a lot of human uh, participation. Yeah. I in think, the actual creation. I think so. And you know, there's tons of things with technology and auto tune and like whatever, like just to, you know, the way Kanye West uses it and stuff that are really exciting. And to use technology to push things forward is great. Um, but then the idea of like, you know, when you see Adele on stage belting out a song that, that sends chills down your spine, that's, that's something still about the human voice and the way it resonates in our bodies that's really special. Yeah. So now, um, how do you, I mean, you've, had many accolades, many awards, number ones. How do you actually define success personally? Um, well, like probably when I started and my first record came out, like 2003, like, I mean, it sold probably 50 copies, but just the fact that I was headlining this club in Manchester, England for 300 people. Like, I thought that was definitely the biggest it was ever gonna get, and that right. was incredible. Right, and that was great, right? I mean, and it was amazing, yeah. and then these things happen, and then, you know, the goalposts move a little bit, and you have to be careful, because you can keep chasing this thing, like, which is, is never gonna happen. I've definitely had ups and down, sure. hot and cold periods through the term of my career, but I think, I think you just have to, like, 
keep doing. Like, I might never have a record as big as Uptown Funk. In fact, I definitely will never have a record as big as Uptown Funk. <laughs> but the fact is you that, like, we didn't make that record because we were trying to right, make a to big make hit it. record. We were making that because we all love funk and soul. Like, let's make this thing that really turns us on. So I feel like I just need to keep doing that because that's the, that'll be the most genuine thing that I can make. And that's absolutely wise, right? You can't, it's sort of like, all right, go make another one of those viral videos. Right, right? yeah. Or, you know, you ha it has to be genuine. You, you actually can't seek no. being the most viewed or the most listened to. It just, it just has to organically happen. Sure. So let me ask you now our last question. So sort of what's next, and can you share anything that you're working on? Yeah, um, well, you know, one of the things about like being, in, you know, producing and making records and like, music is, uh, I'd say it's like a young man's game, but it's definitely like it's something about youth and the culture that makes it exciting. So, you know, I'm not going to be that guy forever. So I started this um, label and production company to like, you know, foster the next generation of talent and kind of mentor like people did that for me. Right. And, uh, and then I'm working on some records. So I'm working on a project with Diplo, who's a good friend of mine, who we've never made music together, so we're doing something together. Uh, Kevin Parker from Tame Impala, one of my yeah, favorite yeah. bands, and uh, yeah, just I, I'm always making music because I'm lucky to be around really inspiring, creative right. people. Always creating, right? That's really the theme of Max. Just I, create all the time. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, Mark, it has been an absolute pleasure. I know everyone is completely psyched to hear you spin tonight at the Max Bash. Thank you. Yes. So. So again, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure, honor, uh, just to have you sitting here chatting with us. And uh, we can't wait to hear what's next, and we can't wait to hear what you're going to do tonight. And uh, thanks again. Mark Ronson, Great. everybody. Thank you so much. Mark Ronson. Thank you. Thank you, Mark and Jason. Creativity is in all of us, and it needs to be nurtured from a very young age. At Adobe, we're not only passionate about cultivating the next generation of creatives, we believe it's our responsibility to do so. That's why every year we sponsor the Adobe Design Achievement Awards, which attract students working across every creative discipline. This year, students set another record with 6,600 submissions from 64 different countries. And for the second year in a row, Adobe Project 1324, which is our online community for young creatives, partnered with the Sundance Institute to launch a short film competition for youth ages 18 to 24. Winners become Sundance Ignite Fellows, they get to go to the Sundance Film Festival, and they get a year-long mentorship. This year, we received 800 short film submissions, and that was twice the number that we received the first year. Let's watch a quick reel of the amazing work that's coming out of these programs. Your power, brothers and sisters, and never forget your power of choice. I want there to actually be a change. And push society forward. Art leads to impact. Together, we are really inspiring each other to create with progress. You just have to commit to one vision and just go for it. Let's go! Remember that you are divine. You have the power to choose. To choose how you react, how you walk, how you talk. How to use honesty and sincerity, how to speak in the language of dreams. Each poem a wingspan, each stanza a world. Our creativity is a force, and so are we. trying to make the films that I that I saw when I was younger. It's about just telling a story and grabbing that person on the other side of the screen. We want to let other people know that they aren't alone. What ties us all together is not our silence, 
but our speech. So we are really excited. The winners of the Adobe Design Achievement Awards and the Sundance Ignite Adobe Project 1324 project are here with us today. Shine a light. Get up. All of you get up. Bravo. Fantastic work. Thank you. So glad to have you guys here.